Okay, so our long international browser nightmare is over. Google web apps like G Suite now work as expected in Safari. So do Squarespace and WordPress. It's a modern mobile miracle, but it's also more than that. A download manager, a ton of keyboard shortcuts with modifiers, the ability to save and open tab sets, per site settings, text size controls, the whole web kit and caboodle. The full on web finally optimized for iPad or the iPad finally optimized for the full on web. And it's coming with iPad OS this fall. And a fair amount of it is also coming to iOS 13 for the iPhone as well. Hit subscribe, refresh the bell gizmo so you don't miss the next video deep dive. And then let's get to it. I'm Rene Ritchie and this is Vector. When Steve Jobs announced the original iPhone in 2007, he announced mobile Safari along with it. Built on the same KHTML based WebKit rendering engine as Safari on the Mac, it was meant to put real browsing in the palm of your hands and the tips of your fingers. And if you weren't watching the keynote back then with a WAP or proxy or pocket browser or whatever in your pre iPhone you were using at the time, it's hard to properly describe what it was like to see the New York Times actually rendering on a tiny screen and still looking like the New York Times. Not the baby internet, indeed. But just like no good deed goes unpunished, no innovation goes unabused. In order to fit regular websites on the smaller screen, mobile Safari scaled down the width. Then to keep it legible, it boosted up the text size and let you tap or pinch to zoom in or out of sections based on their HTML elements. As iPhone and mobile Safari grew more popular, many websites started to make optimized versions to even better fit the tiny iPhone screens portrait screens, and Apple and major third parties were all too happy to help them out. In the beginning, and still way too much to this day, they'd simply detect for mobile Safari or anything like it and serve you the mobile, the M.0 version of the site instead of the regular desktop version. Over time, some sites adopted more robust, responsive and adaptive designs that rearranged themselves based not on what kind of browser or device it detected, but on properties like how wide the window was, but not enough of them. So when Steve Jobs announced the iPad in 2010 and showed off the New York Times looking even better on the even bigger screen, little did he realize the problem that would follow. A variety of sites for a variety of reasons, including just looking at the user agent instead of querying the actual size, ended up just serving up tiny iPhone optimized websites to the bigger iPad, simply because it also used a version of mobile Safari. Over time, when even the iPad's growing share of mobile browsing and e-commerce failed to convince even big companies with tons of smarts and resources to put in even the barest possible effort to just serve the right version of the site for the screen, Apple added a request to desktop option to Safari so you, the humble user, could force it to give you the full page. But sometimes it just didn't work because the server kept trying to force you back to mobile and every time it was just a one-time fix. You couldn't just set Safari or a specific site to always give you the desktop version, despite my pleading for it repeatedly. Thanks, Radar. There have been a few other power user frustrations over the years as well, including, surprise, surprise, the lack of a file system to better handle uploads and downloads or any way to manage them. And sure, developers would love a full on version of the Mac OS Safari console embedded into the iPad as well. iPad OS lucky number 13 can't help with that last one, at least not yet, but it sure can help with just about everything else. So my previous process for loading YouTube or Reddit or any similar site on the iPad was this. Hit the bookmark, watch the ridiculous iPhone version stretch out across the screen, scream, then long press the reload button and demand the desktop version. So what I wanted from Apple was just a way to set the desktop version as default. But what we've gotten with iPadOS is actually a lot more. Now desktop is the default. In other words, Apple is now presenting iPad Safari not as mobile like the iPhone anymore, but as desktop like the Mac. Safari for iPad is also adding support for specific application programming interfaces, API, like Visual Viewport, to make this not just work, but actually just work better. Instead of treating all iPads the same, from the 7.9 inch Mini to the 12.9 inch Pro, and rendering all sites on them all the same, Apple is adjusting the viewports to match the display size. That way, on the biggest iPad, you get as much of a website as possible, in as normal a text size as possible, but on the smallest iPad, you get a scaled down and text boosted version. 
Now, for websites that aren't responsive or adaptive, Apple will only try and force the desktop version when the window is wide enough for it to be optimal. For example, when you're in full screen mode or half screen in landscape. If you load into a narrower window, including a slide over, Apple will still try and pull the iPhone version of the website to better fit that column. Same way it tries to use the compact iPhone interface for an app instead of the regular iPad version in slide over. And because turnaround isn't just fair play, but utterly hilarious, you can now manually request the mobile website instead, if and when that just makes more sense to you or looks better to you. Apple has also polished up a ton of small things. For example, websites that depend on complex drop-down menus with mouse hover events are now much better mapped to multi-touch taps. Basically, Apple tried to make even Google's G Suite just work. As much as sites should have been trying to be better iPad citizens, this is stuff Apple should have done way earlier to make good iPad citizenship easier. There are some areas where websites still need to help Apple help them though. Safari for iPad has also added support for pointer events, which abstract away the difference between mouse or trackpad interactions and touch interactions. But to work well, websites have to adopt them. Hopefully, this will encourage them to do just that. The original iPad in 2010 shipped with the keyboard dock, basically something that looked like it was stolen from an iMac and stabbed with a 30-pin dock connector. But no one took it seriously. The original iPad Pro in 2015 shipped with something much better, the smart keyboard. Unfold it, and while you don't quite have a laptop, you have a typing experience that's pretty close to one, as long as you don't have to stop typing just to tap things on the screen. To solve for that, Apple has announced 30 keyboard shortcuts that have been implemented into Safari for iPadOS. Sure, there are a bunch of keyboard shortcuts that anyone familiar with Safari on the Mac will instantly feel at home with. Things like Command Plus and Command Minus to zoom in and zoom out, which also works in reader mode. Command Shift N for a new private tab, and Shift Command T to restore the last closed tab. The recently closed list also lingers longer now if you need to go back further or more broadly. You can scroll all inertial style with the up and down arrow keys. Option up or down will scroll you a page at a time and command up or down to the very top or the very bottom of the page respectively. But you can also use modifier keys for multi-touch actions now as well. Hold down command and tap a link and it opens a new tab in the background, which means it doesn't force you into that new tab. It just leaves you where you were. Command shift and tap that link though and it opens the tab and takes you there with it. Shift and tap a link and that link will be added to your reading list. Option and tap a link and you'll download it. The tap modifiers aren't as elegant as mouse modifiers, at least not for me, not yet. And yes, you can use a mouse or a trackpad with your iPad now, but they're a good way to add a little speed to the tapping process instead of having to long press, wait for the context menu, and then scan and tap again to do what you want to do. When you do long press on a link though, the new style preview opens up super quick and the new shortcut options are pretty dope. Split view or side-by-side -side windows in Safari were introduced a couple of years ago as sort of a special in-app case. Now with iPadOS, all apps can have multiple windows in multiple workspaces. So Safari may not be as special anymore, but it's even more flexible and powerful. Just drag Safari into as many side-by-side -side workspaces or swipe over windows as you want and switch between them whenever and however you like. It's great for reading or watching while you take notes, dragging and dropping content from one app into another, or chatting while you work, but it can also be a lot. If you lose track, you can just expose or show all windows and toss away any or all you no longer need, though you can't toss them all away at once yet. You can also have multiple tabs in each window, of course. And like I said, you can now open tabs in the background and in new windows. You can even long press on a tab to get additional options, including to sort by title and by website. But to save all of us from ourselves, you can also now set tabs to close automatically. And wait, wait, I just heard the voices of a thousand nerds screaming out, but don't worry, it's fine. It won't happen by default. And if you choose to set it, you can set it to a day, a week, a month, or never. You can long press on the bookmark button to save the currently open set of tabs as a folder. You can then open a bookmark folder as a set of tabs that lets you easily make and return to sets of tabs you need to use regularly. If you hit the share sheet and the new option button, you can choose to share a tab as a PDF file or a good old fashioned web archive instead of just the link as normal. Even screenshots have gotten a Kryptonian style yellow sun boost. Snap one now, open up the quick preview, and there's a new full page option. And <laughs> hot damn, but I wish I could do that on the Mac. 
Up front, a download manager just looks like a dropdown that lists any and all files you've downloaded since you began using it or since the last time you cleared it. Plus, an easy way to go right to any of those files when you want to do something with them. But what makes a download manager truly useful and why people have wanted one on iPad and iPad Safari for so long is for everything that happens behind the scenes. With the new iPad OS and yes, iOS 13 for iPhone download manager, once you start a download, it gets handed off from the browser window process and becomes a property of the download manager. And that way it keeps working in the background, even if you leave tabs or leave Safari entirely. The download will just go until it finishes and will be available available to you in the download manager anytime you choose to go back to it. By default, downloads will go into iCloud Drive, but you can go into Settings, Safari, and change the default to your iPad or to any other location in iCloud Drive or on your iPad. That gives Safari the permission it needs to save to that specific folder. When external providers like Dropbox and Drive have their respective apps updated to iOS 13, hopefully we'll see them as options as well. Uploads have also gotten improved. Now you can pick from anything in your photos or files library and Safari will just upload it from wherever you picked. There's a new unified options dropdown in the address bar. Just tap on what looks like a font size button where the reader mode button used to be and you get options to sure, go into reader view, but also to hide the toolbar, request the aforementioned mobile website view or go into the per website settings. Once you're in reader view, the dropdown turns back into the previous reader style options list with a big old option to get back out of reader view right at the top. There's a new typeface option though, because Apple has a new typeface. Well, and everything's old is new again typeface. It's called New York and it's the serif counterpart to San Francisco, which Apple made the system and company typeface a few years ago. Apple recently added it to the new books app and now it's in the reader as well. Where San Francisco was an evolution of the Helvetica Noia style Apple has been embracing since iOS 7, New York has its roots in Susan Kerr's original city-themed typefaces for the original 1984 Mac. You've also got all the same themes in Reader, including white, sepia, gray, and black. But with iOS 13, if you're in dark mode for apps, it'll default you to black for Reader as well. While websites can update to honor dark mode settings, this is a great feature for the really, really bright ones that haven't or won't get around to it yet. Hide toolbar, as you imagine, gets rid of the extra interface, like the address bar, basically what's happened for years already once you started scrolling. The difference is the address bar won't come back if you start scrolling back. You have to tap on the remaining status bar to get the full toolbar back. Since desktop is the new default, you can now request the mobile site. If and when you do though, the menu item reverts back to request desktop site, you know, like 2013 again. And that way you can toggle back and forth whenever you need to. Website settings gives you a site specific version of the full Safari settings. So instead of just universally enabling or disabling request desktop or reader view or privacy settings like camera, microphone, and location, you can set them individually for each site. Safari's original goal was simple be fast, the fastest, like speed force fast. Over time, it's gotten a couple other goals though as well, be secure and be private. So basically the new goal is still fast, but like stealth fast. Continuing in that tradition, Safari and iOS 13 now includes sign in with Apple. I've previewed it a couple times already, links in the description, and I'll do a whole video on it at some point. But what it means is that you can log into any supporting website just by authenticating with Face ID, or Touch ID, and Apple will take care of the rest, including generating anonymized email relays for you if that's what you want. For Apple sites like iCloud.com, it'll also let you sign in using the Apple ID on your device, so you don't have to re-enter your password or two-factor on the same device. You just scan your face or fingerprint and you're good to go. If you do need to create an individual password, like an animal, Safari will warn you if you pick a weak one. To keep things consistent, all of the new Safari features are also now available in the Safari view controller. That's a version of Safari that other apps can embed right into their apps. And that means any app that uses it or switches over to it gets all this new functionality for quote unquote free, significantly improving security and convenience even when you're not using Safari directly. To make it even better, Safari view controller will now offer to hand off a page just like full on Safari to your other devices. 
for other types of apps, like browsers that use WK WebView instead of Safari View Controller, developers can switch to a new application name for user agent string that'll let iPad Safari handle desktop class browsing for them as well. Developers can also choose between recommended, mobile, and desktop modes if they prefer. There's even a new API to show OAuth form sheets in apps in mobile mode. And if you want additional security, there's Eero. Eero is a launch partner for Apple's new iOS 13 HomeKit Secure Router feature, but that's not coming until later this year. What you can get right now is total network protection. Eero Plus offers the ability to block malicious and unwanted content across your entire network. Advanced security. By checking the sites you visit against a database of millions of known threats, Eero Plus prevents you from accidentally visiting malicious sites without slowing anything down. Content blocking. Eero Plus automatically tags sites that contain violent, illegal, or adult content, so you can choose what your kids can and cannot visit right in the Eero app. And ad blocking. Get rid of annoying ads and pop-ups on all of your devices. Ad blocking also improves load times for ad-heavy sites so you can browse and stream faster than ever before. There are also third-party security apps. VPN protection from encrypt.me password management from 1Password, and antivirus software from Malwarebytes. Get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year of Eero Plus by going to eero.com slash vector and using promo code vector at checkout. Thanks Eero and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Back in the earliest days of iOS, before the iPhone was even a thing, a big part of the project, of the dream, was to put the web, the real web, in the palms of your hands and at the tips of your fingers. Not a dumbed down baby web website or an old school computer browser grafted into a tablet, but something new and novel and tactile and engrossing, the full on web for full on multi-touch. And now almost a decade later, we finally have it or at least the path towards it. There's still no developer console or robust plugin architecture, though there are specific extensions like content blockers. But Rather than a baby step, this really is a big leap forward, and hopefully just the first of several. I wish Apple had done this years ago, back when the original iPad Pro shipped, but I'm really glad they put the time and effort into polishing it all up now. But let me know what you think. Hit like if you do, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and then hit up the comments and tell me, what do you think about desktop browsing on the iPad? Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.